Are you interested in landing more sync licensing opportunities in your music career? Did you know you could make six figures at it without any kind of notoriety or fame? Are you sincere in your desire to create the life you love through music? That's what we're going to be looking at in this episode of the New Music Industry Podcast. Today I'm passing the mic with singer, songwriter, producer, Adam McInnes. How are you today, Adam? I'm doing good, man. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining me today. And this is kind of a compulsory question as of late, but how have you been holding up during pandemic lockdowns? I would say that um, I don't really mind this kind of thing. I mean, I, I mind the what's happening in the world, but as far as having time for people to disconnect from, I think, a lot of the adrenaline spiking uh, algorithms that are going on and having more time to just focus back on what's important and being close with family. Uh, some of those things I think are actually imperative to our survival as a species. So if I was to remove the fact of what we're going through and just say, I'm in a place where I'm safe and healthy and I'm surrounded by someone I love and get to make music every day, then those things have all been great. Yeah, I'm with you as well. And I do hear a lot of positive reports. You know, people have been falling in love or they've been more productive with their music than ever. Whatever the case, they've been able to accomplish some things during this time. And I think overall, that's a positive thing. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at it from two, two standpoints in that or two sides of the coin, because also it's the highest level of divorce going up right, <laughs> and highest level of other things, you know, aren't to laugh about, but alcoholism and depression. And so I think a lot of this stuff has to do with the person and how they perceive the world that's actually in front of them. It really does. It really does. And that's, that's some deep mindset stuff. We might even get into more of that throughout this interview. Uh, you're currently based out of Austin, Texas. Is that right? Yes, I am based there. I don't live there now. Um, I live yeah. in a different country right now. And oh, wow. I'll probably be here for a bit of time, but I'm in Costa Rica and I've been here for about seven months now. Okay. Wow. That's really cool. I was also kind of in the midst of traveling as a digital nomad before this lockdown happened. So that kind of put a damper on my travels as mm -hmm. it were, but yeah, I can't imagine a better place to be than, I mean, there's, there's definitely some places in the world that are beautiful, but Costa Rica sounds like a wonderful place to be, right? At yeah. This time. I mean, I wake up and I, uh, there's, there's mangoes on the trees. There, <laughs> there's coconuts, there's bananas, there's, uh, the, the beach. Um, the, the things that I, I think we take for granted in the States because we're not in front of them. Let's just say that it's not actually in front of us. Like you're not in front of nature. A lot of times, uh, and we take for granted as if we don't realize how powerful it is. But yeah. when you're surrounded by it, like when I say I'm surrounded by it, I'm at the top of a mountain in the middle of the rainforest. Um, I see, I wake up to the sounds of the monkeys. Um, I have such a plethora of wildlife that comes in and out of the house or around the house on a daily basis that it's like your own nature channel. Um, and just the amount of fresh foods and the things that you can get in the soil, it's just... I mean, you can go to a local market and in the parking lot, there will be mangoes falling from the trees. But mm -hmm. if you go to Whole Foods and try to buy a mango, it's $3. You know, I, I could yes. pull 20 mangoes from a tree and then put it in my, my, my ATV and then uh, be fine. <laughs> I do love those mangoes too. So that's, that's awesome. You've been in music for... I guess over 15 years and you've landed over a hundred sync licensing placements for TV, film and advertisements. So this is something we absolutely need to delve into. I frequently survey my audience asking them what they're struggling with. And some have come back to me with gigs aren't happening. Music sales aren't going to cover rent and live streaming as, t as a tough game and so on and so forth. But uh, I think music licensing is one of those opportunities that might be viable for just about anyone with a laptop and a guitar. Uh, but first, I mean, maybe take us back to when you first got started in music. Okay. Um, yeah, ask away. What, what questions do you want to conquer? You let me know. It sounds like you had a fairly interesting beginning. Like, it, I think your bio says you almost had an accidental introduction to music. Yeah, it, <laughs> I would definitely call it that. <laughs> um, 
So I was in college and I didn't, I didn't play music. I didn't sing. Um, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And I think, especially in college, there's so much pressure from the constructs of society to, to determine what's going to be the rest of your life. And I think that starts at a very young age where they start asking yeah. questions, like even five years old, like when you get older, you're going to be a cop. You're going to be a firefighter, which is a very weird thing when you think about it, like to determine what the person's whole entire existence will be about when they're five. And, mm-hmm. you know, I see it in college, like, what are you going to do for the rest of your life? And I remember I was hit with that moment. And in, in that thought, I said, well, I like, if I looked at things that I actually enjoy, that I can see myself always learning from. And I think that's how I look at things is what can I always be learning from? Because that means I'm always growing. And if I'm always growing, then I'll probably always have a certain kind of hunger and a thirst, which will keep me active and proactive in my whatever it is. And for me, it was either martial arts or music. And those were the two things that I was like, okay, these are two things I can always keep growing and learning from. Um, now, martial arts I had been doing since I was five. So I already was like a high-level black belt. I had already competed. I already like had – was training in different martial arts. So for that one, I was like, I've already been doing this. And I've already experienced certain injuries that I have to really overcome if I'm going to make this a full-time thing. Um, but music is still fresh because I don't really know it yet. And uh, I just know I, I like to do it. And – the way I kind of gauge something is if you could be in your element and time goes by, uh, you know, it's that, it's that uh, time continuum that you get stuck in that, that bottle for a minute, minute uh, a minute. And then all of a sudden three hours pass you by and you're like, where'd the time go? That to me is the, is the moment where you have to say, okay, this is that thing where if you focus on it, you can get better at it because you won't notice the time going by. Because mm-hmm. um, when we're children, we have no understanding of time. So when you're trying to learn your language, you don't realize that your parents had to speak to you in a language, you know, three, four years until you figured it out. But now when people are trying to learn a new language, they get frustrated after two months. And they're like, I don't know the language. Because it's, it's only because of the reference of time. So if you can get lost in that time bottle, uh, and that's what's happening with music, I just have to be at a nightclub. I was a doorman at a nightclub. The nightclub happened to be owned by Backstreet Boys or one of the members of Backstreet Boys. So at that time period, um, everyone who was in the top of Billboard charts for the most part in that era of NSYNC, Backstreet Boys, Britney, Jessica Simpson, Christina Aguilera, you know, O-Town, LFO, like anyone <laughs> who was in that, that range, they came to that nightclub. Hmm. And by them coming to that nightclub, I was meeting people. Like constantly, and wow. I was a musician. I was just meeting people, and you know, we we go to someone's party after the nightclub, or we go someone here, and you're talking to people, and they're telling you their experiences, and I just happen to be around a lot of people who are who are successful or who have just been signed to record labels because a lot of record labels were signing artists from Orlando at that time point, and my well now it's my ex girlfriend, but the the woman who I was dating at the time. She used to work at the nightclub as well. Um, she was like a go-go dancer. Um, you know, someone standing on the podiums dancing for four hours at a time. Yep. And so I was the bouncer. She was the, uh, the go-go dancer. And she just happened to have an insane, amazing, beautiful, incredible voice. And still to this day, she's the best vocalist I've worked with. That huh. that's, says a lot. I've worked with a lot of great singers. But she was that, you know, like unicorn in a sense. And... Um, she happened to be in a record store, walking around looking for you know, different albums to listen to one day. And she was humming along to, I guess, whatever was on the radio in that store. And some guy who happened to be next to her said, are you a singer? And she said, yes. And uh, he's like, do you have anything that you can show me? And she happened to be very prepared. She had already recorded like a 25 song demo. She had all these demo songs that she was, was making and just kind of cataloging. And uh, he heard it. He brought it back to his company, and then within like three months, she was signed to a very big deal at a production company. And then about six months later, she signed a three point six million dollar record deal huh. uh, with Motown and Universal. So when that happened, um, that's when everything kind of changed because she was being like whisked away to all these studio sessions, like flown away out to Max Martin and working with Diane Warren and uh, a lot of time in Atlanta. And a lot of times she would ask me, like, hey, Adam, can you come with me on these sessions? Because I don't feel comfortable. Like, I don't know these people. And, and I think she was also like the idea of, like, now she's the star and I'm the bodyguard. You know, because I was, once again, doorman at a nightclub, high-level degree black belt. I'm her boyfriend, now her bodyguard. 
And uh, so I started to go to these sessions and because I didn't come from music, I didn't know the protocol of the business. You know, like if you sit in a room and you throw out a line, you know, that's not cool. Like I didn't know those things. Mm. So I was the guy who was like, what about this line? What about that line? <laughs> and people didn't, some people were okay with it. Some people didn't like it. Um, but anyway, I got to see the business from a different angle because I wasn't in it. I was just watching. It. Yeah. And, and then unfortunately I also saw the reality of the business, which was, um, she was then dropped and she had some really horrible experiences and just a lot of times, a lot of things she did on her behalf that I think she could have handled a lot better only because there was no tutelage of how to handle a budding career except for your one manager, which I think is insane to take information from one person alone, especially on a massive career, unless that one person is uh, someone you've known for many, many years, but not someone who makes money off of you. Yeah, I don't, I don't believe in that. If someone makes money off of you, uh, I don't take that person's – I, don't, I really don't care how big they are, but if they might have offered you, I always want a delegation of the board of directors helping me make decisions. And so I saw all the things that happened in her career and ups and downs, good, the bads, the uglies, and everything. And I realized myself that like, I could do this because I feel like persistence always wins in everything. And um, there's this there's this quote that um, I think it's Calvin Coolidge has, where it's like nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Like talent will not, nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Yeah. And you know, it says like genius won't either. I think it's like unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. And, and I think that's so true. I've met so many people who are insanely talented, but then they wouldn't do anything on the business side. Yeah. And they, they wouldn't do anything on like, like their work ethic. If, if it wasn't them singing, they almost didn't want to do it. Yep. <laughs> and, and so I would see this over and over again and I would say, okay, the people who I tend to notice, because the way my brain works is it's, it's pattern recognition. That is my, I guess if I had any one trait that stands out, I can look at a pattern and it's like a freak of nature. It kind of puts it together in some weird algorithm. And then I could say, oh, that pattern is in that thing. It's in that thing. It's in that thing. Look, it's there. It's here. It's there. So that's why I've always been good at like puzzles or like IQ tests. Like once I understand the pattern, I'm like, okay, this is what's happening and let me figure this stuff out. So same thing in the music industry. I kind of just looked at it and I realized that most people in the business don't have an engineer's mindset. Um, an engineer has a different mindset and I, that's the kind of brain that I have where I look at something and I figure out how to fix it. And I think a lot of people instead just go along with things. They go, oh, well, they're doing that, so I'm going to follow that. Mm-hmm. And then I say – how do you know that that's working? Yeah. And they say, well, look at their view count. And I say, how do you know that that's not fate? Mm. How do you know that there's not 10 people working on that with different algorithms from hiring people from different countries, sending bots? How do you know these things? So I never take anything at face value. Um, I believe that everything starts from a certain place. And if you study where it came from, you can really have a more hands-on approach to a career or any kind of business or invention. So that's what I did. I said, you know what? I'm going to put my engineer's mind onto this business. And I figure that over enough time with persistence, I can learn how to become talented. Because I was in college. I was completely tone deaf. I could not sing. I could not play instruments. I didn't have a a lick of natural ability for any of this stuff. Um, I just enjoyed it a lot. And then uh, I think within five years of me saying I'm going to do this – I signed a record deal. I had, uh, I was on TV shows. I was winning competitions. Um, my career kind of started. And so it's kind of the reason why I, I tell people, like I have friends who are vocal coaches on, you know, major TV shows or things like that. And I'll send them a vocal, a, like a vocalist or upcoming artist that quote unquote, and they'll say, Hey, this person can't really sing. And I'm like, so, and they're like, well, I don't think I can help them. And I'm like, but I was able to go from tone deaf to sign a record deal within five years. Why can't that person? So it's interesting how I I know people who will turn down others because that person isn't already polished. And in my mind, I'm like, if you can find someone who's really persistent, you can teach, you can teach talent to anyone. Mm -hmm. Talent is a learned behavior. It's just repetition of certain um, patterns. Once you do that, talent becomes compound interest. Hmm. 
Wow. I'm glad I asked because I really love your answer. And I love that the universe is sending me lots of like-minded people to have on the show just like you. So thank you. Uh, I think my pleasure. I love it when the guests do my work for me. It's probably a bunch of questions I don't even have to ask anymore. <laughs> That's good. But, That's good. I would love to get into uh, licensing and placements now. So just in, as sure. an overview, what's sync licensing? Why is it important? And how can it transform an artist's career? Hmm. Simplest way of saying this, there's no other field in the business or no other division or section where you don't need a manager, you don't need a publisher, you don't need a label, you don't need to spend a dime on promotion, you don't need a following or a fan base, and you can make $100,000 a year. Yep. Wow. It's the only part of it that you can do that in. And more importantly, you don't even need a face. Wow. And I, I'm telling you this because I've already done it more than once. I have, I have artists or monikers that I go under that you don't know what the person looks like because there's no face behind it. And we've made well over you know, $200,000 in a year. Yeah. So it's an interesting thing. Whenever I talk to people about sync, I go, you know, most artists, when I ask them questions like, what is it that you want in your career? And they usually say, well, I need a manager. And I say, why? <laughs> yeah. And, and then they tell me whatever their answer is. And I'm like, okay, cool. I say, what else do you need? I, I think I need a publishing deal. Okay, why? They tell me the reason. And then after that, I'll get a record deal. Okay, why? So I kind of walk through all these things that they tell me they need. And then I say, well, where did you get that information from? And usually it starts off with, I saw a movie or I heard from so-and-so that I read an article on that they did this, or I saw blah, blah, blah. And I go, cool. Did you ever look to see what happened after the movie? Hmm. And the answer usually stops right there. Because the way movies are presented is they have to end on a high adrenaline spike, yes. which means everything comes together for that person for that one moment. But they're not showing you how to create longevity. That's a different thing. Longevity is, is something that can be balanced over many years, and it's going to have its ups and its downs, but it's keep, it keeps on going forward where, yeah, you might get signed to a record deal, and then you might get dropped. You might get shelved. You might get stuck in contract for five years. I have several friends that have been stuck in contracts for five, ten years. You can do all that stuff, and you don't actually even own everything because you're signing kind of like a contract into slavery. Yeah, you are. And when I, when I tell people this, I said, but – it, the only reason why it's a contract kind of like slavery is if you go back and look at where the contract started. They started during a time period when people came out of slavery. So it, it made sense. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. It's the reason why they're called you know, master recordings and if the duplicate of the master is called the slave. You know, these things are in the contracts. So if you look at the verbiage, it's kind of like the reason why everyone says words today like, on my journey. I, I, almost one of those things that even I can't stand sounding it when I hear it when myself say it. Like, you know, in, this, in, in my story, in my journey, in the next chapter of my life, the only reason why people say that is because we all were read books when we were children every night we went to sleep. Yeah. And our parents would put these words in our heads. In the next chapter, the prince did this and the princess gets that. And we watched Disney films. And so then what happens is people start to live by these theories of that's what's going to happen to them. Like it's all going to come together in this magic moment. Yeah. And I know some people who've been chasing that magic moment for 20 years Oof. and they're no farther than they were when they first started. You know, they've had a couple of successes. Then they, most of it's pretty much thought of them posting a lot of pictures online and show everyone else that they, they want people to see them as the character type that they want to see themselves as. Yeah. But if you ask them to open up their bank account and then you ask them to look at their actual, you know, credits or their, their, the thing that they've created for themselves and more importantly for others, like what have they done? It's a very dismal amount of things that can be shown, but there's a ton of, a lot of pictures on Instagram and Facebook and YouTube <laughs> and video content, right? Yeah. So when I look at the sync world, I look at the only part of the industry where you can own your masters, you can own your publishing. You don't need a manager. You don't need a label. You don't need a publisher. You don't need uh, a promotion. You don't even need to spend money, but more importantly, you are paid <laughs> and you are paid when you sell the song where if you get a track, let's say on a, on a, uh, on a big artist, you don't see money until you start seeing residual income, which could be a year, year and a half later. Like you can get a call tomorrow. that says you just got the new hit on Rihanna. And then 
if you don't have a if you have a publishing deal already, you might not see that money until a year, year and a half later when that album is released. Till and if it's not the single, then you might not see a lot of money at all. If there's ten writers on the track, it keeps going down. So yeah, kudos. You got a song every hour. What's that going to do when you have to buy a house if you only made you know twenty thousand dollars? So I kind of look at things a little differently, and I say. To me, music is a passion of mine that is a business. And every personal mentor that I have or someone I look up to in the music business treats it as a business and not just as this dreamlike delusion that they're free to bump their heads into tons of walls and everything will just work out for them. Hmm. Um, it's, it's a place of like making an income that you can provide for your family and for yourself. And then hopefully if you make enough, you create generational wealth. Yeah. And that's how I look at this business. Just like I look at any business I get involved in, mm. but you know, I'm, I'm involved in five other companies. Wow. So, you know, music is just a passion of mine that I love and I, I constantly keep my, my hand and my whole body and spirit into it. But you know, I have other companies that I'm building as well because I just love building things. Yeah. Um, I don't need to make my ego feel good by other people clapping for me. Does that make sense? It does. So I think that that's a big thing about musicians sometimes is that we by nature are usually a bit insecure. And so we want to feel that insecurity by having people clap for us. Mm. And that's like uh, the likes on Instagram and Facebook. Those are the new claps of today. Yeah. So if you really think about where clapping stops after you get a college degree, no one really gets claps anymore. After, after the graduation from college, there's no more claps really going on. And so those clappings are a piece of adrenaline that are telling you that you're accepted in the tribe. And then when you don't have that for a while, sometimes people do things that are completely out of their character only because you're trying to fill that void. And I, I know we all kind of get lost in that for a bit because we're trying to find what we say is ourselves, but a lot of times we already know who we are. We're just trying to, to figure out how we fit amongst these, this big worldwide tribe now. And I think that's the big trick that this, the industry pulls people into and they get kind of lost. And they say, I'm trying to find myself. I'm like, no, nah, you already know who you are. You just need to fine tune yourself, but find is something different. Um, so what I like to look at sync is go make the music you like to make, um, create your business around it. And what will happen is if you write 30 songs, well, one of those songs might cross over to radio. Or like, you know, last year I had a song that was on top, top global Shazam songs, top 50 global Shazam songs. That was a song that was in a movie. Um, I did uh, 10 seconds on the TV show Los of Lucifer, um, my band. Mm. So my, my voice was heard just like two weeks ago. It's got over 11,000 Shazams in 10 seconds. Wow. So the way I look at sync is it's an awesome side of the industry that it gives you the opportunity to make great music. That's the whole point. You can make great music. You can get paid for it. You don't need a bunch of people taking stuff out of your check just to see daylight. You can get your head above water. You can build your business. You can make music literally. Like I make music every day. Like sometimes I'll have three sessions a day. So I'm constantly in that feeling, you know, meeting people from all around the world, feeling great about it. I get to ride that high. But more importantly, it's not just for my own personal ego. I actually get to build a business that's lucrative. Mm. That's really cool. You know, so many things I can connect to there and elaborate on. But what I will say is this. At the end of July, I started publishing a blog post every single day without fail. And mm -hmm. I started following only my Dream 100 on social media and pretty much stopped, stopped following anybody else. Yep. And so, like, naturally, when I go to social media now, I don't want to say it's boring. I'm just not really inclined to spend a lot of time there. I'm just <laughs> saying, hey, how's it going? Bye. And I'm out. And, and it's like, yep. yeah, I'm just not there anymore. I'm doing something that I believe is benefiting others. And that's what I want to do. So it, commend, commend, I commend you for finding that in yourself because those, those like, um, and you probably heard them. I think we've all heard them when someone's like, Listen, you really want to focus on what brings you the most joy and what brings joy to others. And if you can do that and cultivate it and really take time, it'll grow eventually. That sounds very basic and a little bit cheesy. But the truth is, is that that's how everything works. Hmm. The, the problem that I think a lot of people go into is that the new society is being programmed from the computer, which is 
you put a question into Google and within two seconds, it looks through 1.4 billion sites or something and parts of information. So you're used to extremely fast instant gratification. Whenever you want something, it's there. Yeah. But when you actually have to say, I have to build compound interest, like one day be better than I was the day before and I have to stick to this, most people can't do that for three years on something. Hmm. And that to me is the difference. Like, and I'm, I'm being very serious. I call it the three-year mark. Hmm. Most people cannot for three years just do something that they love every single day and make sure that they become a little bit better than they were yesterday and keeping that in mind. But the people who can, those are the people who, when I, when I meet people, and I'm being honest, like there was a point in my life, because we're not, we're not going too deep, but like I'm from, you know, not, not the best parts of town. Like I was raised in New York, I was raised in Jersey City, you know, walking to school, uh, they'd have an assistant walk us to class because there was too many heroin or crack vials on the floor. So they'd have to step on them before we got to class. Wow. So that way we didn't see them. Like when, when we've got our Game Boys or our little Nintendos, the, how we got them is because you'd always see somebody would randomly rob a truck going to Toys R Us and they'd bring them through our neighborhood and we'd buy them, you know, for 10 bucks, 15, 20 bucks. Like that's where I was raised. So when I see people like, like not go three years deep into something. And I'm not talking about just posting on social media. I'm saying, say I'm going to become better than I was the day before, which means I might have to um, study a little bit more. I might have to spend a couple more extra hours to fine tune my instrument and really become great and proficient at it. I might have to um, teach other people so that way I become better. I might have to dig a little bit deeper than I did before. Whatever that is to someone, most people will not do that for three years. They'll just post things pretending to do. And the people that I've been meeting lately in my life in the last like four years, which are billionaires, and multimillionaires, and it's a whole other stratosphere of executives and entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. They're all just normal people. They're normal people who, when I usually ask them these kind of questions, like, so, you know, how'd you get here where you are? And they said, actually, you know what? I'll, I'll do this. I'll give you a, a few of the best pieces of advice that, I've heard other people say that I went, that is so simple, but it's just, it's most people would yeah. um, So one is, and simple is put 20% of every check you make into savings. Mm -hmm. Sounds super simple, but when you do it after five years and you realize that the power of money is just more freedom to say no. So when you have money and someone says, hey, you should do this, you should do that. You should be like, no, I don't want to do that. And they're like, but it's a great paying job. You're like, I already have money. I don't have to do it. I don't have to put my time on anything else other than what I want to do. And I have the freedom to say no when I want. Or sometimes you get put against a wall and they're like, I have to say yes to this. It's like, why? So that was one thing that I learned was put 20% of every check I make into savings. Other thing was only bet on extraordinary people and extraordinary uh, ideas. And I think that was really powerful too because a lot of times artists are just so – a lot of people will try to get good enough to where others see greatness in them. Now, I want to really look at that. A lot of people are only trying to get good enough so that someone else sees greatness in them. That's not how anything works. But there's tons of artists and writers and producers who are like, oh, I don't want to go all in. So I'm only going to work you know, two hours a day at my craft, but I want to pay me $100,000 a year. I'm like, you're an insane person. It's not going to happen. But the person who goes, I don't care about what you think. I'm just going to become extraordinary. Well, that person attracts the things that they're talking about because the word extraordinary, I'm probably going to run into about a million ordinary people. But if I find that one that's extraordinary and I help them, well, things happen really, really fast whenever that, that works out. So I only bet on extraordinary people. Um, another thing is watching out for uh, victim mentality. That's one thing that's really prevalent in today's society. Um, there's a lot of victim mentality being almost like like profitable. Yeah. And if anything, it's only profitable for the companies that are doing it, not for the person. So the TV show gets tons and tons of views for victim mentality. But the victim doesn't make more money. The victim gets put under more stress. They just keep reliving that same thing that they were trying to, to get through. And then there's a lot of victim mentality that is perpetuated in other people who are like not even going through the same thing, but the person's like, well, I'm going to claim victim on this. And it could be as simple as victim in their own life. Like I was talking to an artist recently and I said, hey, how come you're not showing up for your own job? 
like at your job is music, right? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, how come you didn't show up to your session? Like you, you just didn't even call anyone. You didn't even show up to your session. And they're like, oh, I just got so busy and I got so pissed. And I said, you got busy during a pandemic? Like, what were you yeah. doing? And they're like, oh, I just like my organization skills are not good, Adam. I just forgot to put on my calendar. And so I was like, and they go, you know, what? it's probably because when I was growing up, you know, my parents never, and they started telling me this whole story. And I was like, so wait, you're going to blame your parents for the fact that you missed a session for your career and you're going to claim victim on that? <laughs> and I tend to notice that patterns of people don't just happen in one instance. They happen throughout all their instances of life. Yeah. So, you know, if someone plays victim to their calendar schedule, well, they're going to play victim to how the relationships work out. They're going to play victim to how come they don't have enough money. And if they don't study, you know, how to make enough money, then they're also going to play victim to where no one gave them a book, even though books you can go on Audible or on Google and get them. Yep. So, you know, there's all this stuff that I think carries over. So it's like watching out, especially if, if you're doing a business, to watch out for victim mentality because you can help out a people left and right but if someone's narcissistic and they're a victim which is like the, tr the trick of the trade right now it's like it's a narcissism where someone wants everyone to do something for them but they don't want to put in the work to achieve it on themselves that will usually self-destruct at some point and so i look for people to work with who who don't have a self-destruct button hmm. and unfortunately that that is true pretty much in you know 99 of all animals in the planet Humans are the ones who have self-sabotage and self-destruction buttons. And so I'm really good now at figuring out who's got them and staying away from those people. So I would say those things are like good advice. Definitely also is if you don't know something, ask an expert, but more importantly, ask five. Mm. Because one expert's going to be only seeing from how they were taught and someone else is only going to see how they were taught. If you ask five, you tend to get a pretty rounded out view of what the subject really is and all the intricate parts of it. And from that, you can make the best decision. So I always ask five experts if I'm really like stuck on a certain, you know, I don't know how this thing works in the music business. I don't know how royalties work. I don't know how to build a company. I'm going to ask five people who I believe are experts and not my friends. Well, my friends now are experts, but not my friends 10 years ago. I, I it's, it's very rare that your friends are experts at those things unless you are one as well. Wow. Those are some killer tips. I really loved it. And I can relate, especially when I was trying to figure out how to play the pentatonic scale across the entire guitar. Mm. That took me a while to figure out. But I found that the more articles I read on it from different sources, the greater my understanding of that subject was. And finally, I think I found something from Eric Johnson where he said, I shift between the patterns and that is what clicked for me. It might not be what clicks for someone else, but that made a hundred percent sense. And suddenly I was able to play across the entire fretboard. It makes total sense because what, what's happening is that, all right, so the way I look at everything is let's say you had a Rubik's cube and you put it in the middle of a room. And I told you, you know, I, or I asked you, what do you see from your perspective? And you're going to say, well, I see blue, red, yellow, da, 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 and they're in, in this certain order. I go, cool. If I had five people looking at that Rubik's Cube, we can actually make it fit all the same colors because we would know, okay, if you move that one to the left and move that one to the right and move this one to the left and we talked and communicated, we can actually do it by just like telling an algorithm of what we see. But if you only see your one perspective, there's no way we're going to get there in any time soon during our lifetime. Yeah. So the reason why I always use the five experts is because I do this with everything. Like music, music aside, but like I do jujitsu as well, like Brazilian jujitsu. Mm. Whenever, whenever I train, I or when I want to learn something, I hired people who are experts in different parts of the, even the body. Like I hired someone who's an expert at leg locking. I hired someone who's an expert at you know top game. I hired someone who's an expert at judo. Like I hire experts in different sections because that gives me the whole entire body. And this is the reason why I can do jujitsu with a high level black belt or, or someone who is a black belt and I can still like tap them, which means like you beat them in a round and I'm nowhere near their quote unquote belt level. But as far as knowledge, I have a pretty robust knowledge because I've hired masters from each of those different sectors. I love it. That's great. 
And I think that's a tip anyone can take and apply. Like you said, simple, but simple to do, simple not to do. So exactly, it's a matter of doing it. Um, I'm sure with like licensing and placements, one of the first questions people have is, what music library are you using or what licensing companies are you taking advantage of? Is that an important consideration? And if so, which services are you using? That's a really great question. Um, I don't personally think that stuff matters. Hmm. Um, I approach the industry from a different angle, which is clearly. Yeah. So like, here's the way I look at everything. Once again, I love your thing of simple to do, simple not to do. Yeah. Um, if you were a bear who was hungry, would you sit in the woods and wait for fish or do you stand next to the river and wait, wait for them to jump out so you can catch them? Hmm. And I think a lot of people sit in the woods and they ask for fish like as if they're going to rain down from the sky one day. And what I do is I just sit next to the streams because the streams of currency are where they're probably jumping. So I believe on having one-to-one ratios in everything that I do. Because whenever there's a middleman or there's red tape, you're paying for that red tape. It's like a toll road. So if you can remove as many toll roads, you're staying closer to the streams of income. Um, and so if you look at streams of income, look at it like this. Uh, current energy, that streaming, is called currency. So as long as the energy is moving, it's creating a current of energy, which creates currency. So... I do that with everything. So when someone says, well, what library? I'm like, libraries? I don't know. Like, who cares? I'm going to be talking to the director. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Like, who does this? I'm like, I'm friends with the script writer. You know, I'm friends with the the A&R at the sync company. I'm friends with, uh, you know, the A&R at the admin company. Or I signed an admin deal. Or, um, for instance, like, I started, I'm a partner in a sync company now. So like, I was like, well, I'll just do it myself too with a bunch of my great friends and collaborators and ex- respected executives that I know. So all of these things, I think it's more than just like what sync licensing a library. That, there's so many of them. They keep popping up. There's going to be more and more in the next 10 years because sync is the only part of the industry that's actually going up because there's more content from TV shows going up. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. You know? So the way I look at it, it's less important about – about what companies are going to, but like, what are you doing on a personal level? So let me give you some actual, you know, hardcore, uh, I guess, uh, ways that you can walk away from this for anyone listening. So let's look at the percentages of what each one takes, because it's important to know that when you're looking at your yearly income. So most sync libraries take 50%. Most sync agents who are like one-on-one personal agents take 30%. Most admin companies take 25%. And then if you work one-on-one with someone, you don't have to split it at all. And then if you work with other writers or, or other producers who are signed, their publishers or their companies work for you without taking it out of your account. Does that make sense? Yeah. So those are the five places that I focus my time. I work with sync companies. So let's say like a high level sync company or boutique sync company. I'll work with sync agents who are one-on-one people who have great connections. I'll work with my admin company, who is amazing. Concord is an amazing company. I'll work with uh, my own one-to-one ratios with directors and music video directors I know and content creators and script writers I know. And then I'll work with, um, with other writers and producers who are assigned and their companies are pitching. So I think it's more of a uh, collective than a what library thing. <laughs> Okay, so you said, you know, you, you're a creator. I'm a creator too. I love making things. I'm sure people would be curious to know, though, you got so much, like you said, five companies and plus music. Like, I would, you know, I would imagine some people would feel overwhelmed by the sheer volume of things to do or things to manage. How, how do you do it? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, well, one, I am a workaholic. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, two, I love what I do. Yeah. So it's not, it doesn't feel like work. Um, but I've now discovered time management in the last like two years, but really in the last like year, I, I've had, I had to go a little bit more, get more serious with it because I'm doing so many things. And after that it just becomes good at delegation. So 
you know, over each project that I'm working on, I have a, a go-to person that is more day-to-day -day for some of the things. And then I'm overseeing a lot of it. And then we have our board meetings. We have our executive meetings. Um, like right now, I've, and I know this is kind of like a, hack, a life hack, but I only technically work Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Hmm. I, I take off Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So for me, when I say take off, it doesn't mean I'm not doing anything for my work. It's just that I'm not taking any actual business calls or – um, I'm not trying to read emails. I have my assistant reading the emails and only wearing me of things. If it's like a sync license that I have to respond back, I'm like, okay, clear that. Like only text me when it's something that's important um, because and I'll be, this is something for everyone else out there. Um, you've got to watch out. I developed something called computer vision syndrome, mm. which, which it's like a, I didn't even know about it till last two years ago, but basically you start to see squiggly lines and become dyslexic. Um, so I've developed this form of dyslexia through looking at the screens. So I don't like looking at computer screens at all. Like wow. I'm against it, especially when it comes to reading. Um, so all my books that I listen to, you know, I go my daily walks, I listen to my audible books. Um, but I don't like list I don't like looking at screens unless I'm watching a video because there's no words to focus on. So now I have people in place that I trust, who I respect, who are extremely like professional and organized and, because of that, I'm able to more or less just delegate things I need to do. And then I do have freedom to then, like you said, be a part of these other companies because it's, it's not just, I don't have to be there working at them from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. every day. Um, I've already took the time over the last five years to put all those processes in place. Now it's just someone else making sure that they don't break. And that's a lot easier. Yeah, that's a huge part of it, I think, is having that team in place and being able to delegate the right things and focus on the right things, too. Yeah, I mean, I will say, and I'll give this, I don't do shout-outs. I'm not like a shout-out guy. You rarely whatever you say. Because I think it's kind of like self-explanatory. You're saying, I'm going to shout-out, and you're like then saying something. Right? That's what you're <laughs> yeah. But I will say that um, there are certain books, and definitely Tim Ferriss' Four-Hour Workweek, that, that opened my mind to a lot of things. I, I already kind of thought like the way Tim was talking about, but I didn't execute it the, until I actually saw someone else say, here's how I'm doing it. Mm. And then I, I took that uh, mindset along with a book from uh, a guy named uh, uh, MJ DeMarco. He has a book called The Millionaire Fast Lane. I took basically the four-hour work week, Millionaire Fast Lane. There's a book by Dale Carnegie called How to Win Friends. Yeah. Influence Others. That's a great book. Um, so I took some of these, these major points, the pivotal moments of things that I wasn't actually applying. And whenever I read these books, I would write down what I call the aha moments, which are basically moments in your brain where you, your, your subconscious realizes, I never knew that. And even if I did, I haven't been doing that with intensity or with, uh, with focus. And so I would write down this list and I probably have like a book that has 10 pages of all these aha moments. And I said to myself, I'm going to start to implement these things. And as I started to implement them, I started seeing, you know, changes in my life and more freedom and more money and more opportunities and less stress. So I started to do them. And so I would say if you couple all of these aha moments that you get, you'll tend to notice that uh, it makes your job as a creator a lot easier. But more importantly, once again, you have to still become extraordinary at what you do. Um, and I think... Sometimes people are not hunting for that, which it is imperative in our business where you have, I think there's only 1% of our business makes a living. So yeah. if there's only 1% of people making a living, you have to imperatively be not just talented because talented, talent is like a prerequisite to get into the nightclub. You know, like you're trying to get in this nightclub. Yeah. Are you talented? Yeah. Okay. Now you can come into the nightclub. But if you're in VIP is, a, is the 1%. So in order to get in there, you have to do your business work. You got to be proficient at your instrument or your production or your DAW. Um, most people don't study songwriting. It's crazy. Like you, the way I look at even songwriting, I'm like, there's a formula. I have it. I teach my clients how to use it. If you look around at all the people who are at the top, the Pharrells, the Max Martins, the Timberlands, like obviously you see there's a reason why they're able to replicate what they're doing over and over again. It's not because of luck. Mm -hmm. It's a formula that we all have and it might be something that has been embedded in them and it's not written down, but a lot of us have it actually written down in our studios. 
And so we're just using our formula in a creative way, but it's from actual studying and then repetition of the study where, you know, I'll talk to someone. I'm like, do you listen to music or do you hear music? And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, all right, so when you hear a song, and they're like, yeah, I'm like, tell me your favorite song. And so they tell it to me. And I go, cool, what are the chords in that song? And they go, I don't know. And I was like, then you're not listening. You're just hearing something. Mm. If you're listening to it, you know the chords of it. If you're listening to it, you know all the instruments that are used in that song. If you listen to it, you know what the melody notes are hitting because you're using either like you're training how to hear it here or you're actually breaking it down. But like when I hear a song, I look at like a chef. Every single instrument is a new track on the dog, right? So that means those are my ingredients. If I hear a song and I don't know how many tracks are in there, that means I'm not really listening to the song. This means I'm not really tasting the meal. I'm just putting it in my mouth and swallowing it and saying I'm full. Hmm. And if you do that with enough songs, like you take 50 songs that are your favorite songs and actually write them out, write the chord progressions, write the key, write the lyrics down, hand write the lyrics down, you start to see all of a sudden the formula starts to come together. And you're like, oh my God, it's been here the whole time. Totally. Yeah. There was something I didn't even notice until I watched a Rick and Beato video recently. And he was demonstrating how in most pop songs in the chorus, the lyrics actually repeat the same word or the same phrase as said typically more than once, twice, three times, four times. <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe I never noticed that before. But Well, give me, give me an example. What do you mean? What do you, mean? Uh, you know, all you need is love. Well, well, what's the what's the chorus? All you need is love. All you need is love. All you need is love. Oh, oh you're talking about repetition of just the title. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. No, listen, man. That's that's like rule number one on, on the formula I was talking about. <laughs> yeah, I bet. And I'm not surprised yeah. that it is. I just didn't even realize it until recently. Ah, yeah. Let, let me tell you something that's even trippier. If me and you sat down and, and I said to you, I was like, hey, man, let's write a song together. Mm -hmm. Cool. Let's say you came to my studio and – I said, hey, I got this idea, but I want to make sure we repeat the title at least 96 times. <laughs> you, you would look at me and be like, are you kidding, Adam? That has to be a joke. Right, yeah. Right? And I said, okay, what about 60 times? You'd be like, no, man, like no songs do that. And I can literally show you a several songs that have repeated the title 96 times. Wow. And those songs are making, and those are in sync too. And they're from some of the top sync writers and producers. But if I said it to you, it doesn't make logical sense. But if you saw it and counted, then you would go, oh, my God, it's been there the whole time. Mm -hmm. So, like, take for example, Ellie Goulding's Burn. She says burn, I think, 60-plus times in that song. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's a trick. That's a trick, once again, that, that are in certain formulas. Now, this is much deeper than songwriting. This is based on how people learn information. People learn information. I'm not going to go through the whole, you know, we can set for a whole other talk because in itself yeah. is a, it's a certain level of, of understanding how the human brain works, which I can, I can break that down too. But when you're talking about repetition, if I say something to you 30 times, you're going to walk away and remember the word that I said. So if I'm trying to sell a song, I should better be repeating the part that I want you to be singing in your head. Mm -hmm. If I'm not doing that, then I'm hoping that you'll remember something in a world where people can rarely remember things for more than five seconds. The attention spans are so short right now. How about this? He's even crazier. Let's say, you know, when you're in your 60s, you're telling grandkids, you're telling family members about this amazing artist named Beyonce. You know, back in my day... There's this artist named Beyonce, and she was an amazing talent. She went all around the world and you know, had, was an actress and just a, just, a, just a pivotal woman in history. She was able to inspire lots and lots of women. And you said, and her best song was, so single ladies, from a vocalist, Beyonce is an insane vocalist. Her genetic gift to hit the notes and have a much control through the scales that she has is, is not something that people can just do. It's someone who has practiced and who has a genetic kind of make makeup in her throat and her, her larynx to be able to, to catch those notes like that. Hmm. So let's say that the song that she's most known for in a nightclub is Single Ladies. And go look at how many times she actually sings the word Single Ladies. Right. All the Single Ladies, all the Single Ladies, all the Single Ladies, all the Single Ladies, all the Single Ladies. Put your hands up. She sings that word Single Ladies. I mean – 
I don't I even count it that many times, but when you think about what's happening, for a vocalist of that caliber to say that her best known song is just repeating the same word over and over again, <laughs> it's not the same as that it used to. If you said, what's your favorite Ada James song? What's your favorite Whitney Houston song? Your favorite Mariah Carey song? It'd be these huge, wide range songs. Yeah. But if you say, what's your favorite Beyonce song? Or at least the one that she might be most known from, for people who even aren't fans, they might say something like Symbol Ladies. Or a song to the left, something that's easily repeatable. Yeah. from the masses and so repetition is the key to remember it makes sense and it seems like it should be almost intuitive just because that's how you would practice an instrument is repeating the same technique over and over again but yeah i think a lot of people you're right unless you become conscious or aware of it you just don't see it and mm -hmm. i love that well it's, it's Wait, go ahead. What did you say? Oh, I was going to say, I also love that you really mentioned uh, Tim Ferriss' 4-Hour Workweek because that's really at the foundation of, of what we do here at Music Coach Twitter HQ as well. <laughs> yeah, it's played a huge part in my life. I was, I was into lifestyle design before I knew I was into lifestyle design. I just had to kind of draw the, the, the connection between the dots to be able to see it. Well, it's like until you make, your, until you make the unconscious conscious – It'll just keep directing your life and you'll call it fate. Yeah. You know, so until you start to wake up those parts and go, okay, this is what I'm trying to do. And I think when more people act with conscious thoughts and, uh, and direction, then you tend to see uh, results a lot faster. Hmm. Um, and that's why, like, a lot of times when I talk to people, because I have clients one-on-one, -on -one, like I do mentorships. And so a lot of it is just trying to understand how a person thinks because once I understand how a person thinks, I know how they've been programmed to think. Yes. By either their parents or the world around them, like how they see the world. And then when I can open up a new perspective to show them what they might be missing out on when they think the way that they do, and I can show them it's actually easier to think a different way, it tends to open up a lot more possibilities and they see faster results in general because I'm making their unconscious now conscious of their decisions. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, the decision you're doing right there, they're repeating isn't actually beneficial for your career, right? And they're like, I guess not. I'm like, so we should probably stop doing that thing. Instead, let's insert this, right? And they're like, wow, that makes more sense. And then, okay, cool, let's repeat that over time and that'll become your life. And then it always does. That was like a major revelation to me about 15 years ago when I discovered Steve Pavlina and he talked about making conscious choices. That hit me like a ton of bricks. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's actually what I'm building out here um, in Costa Rica. I'm building a media center for conscious creators. Wow. So it's like a 75-acre retreat center where there's like recording studios, editing bays for, for video editing and music videos, and then movies and TV shows. It has podcast rooms, uh, live-in farm – well, not live-in, but it has a farm, so you can actually just go out there and pick your mangoes and pick your vegetables. But uh, it's a fully – operational media centers so that way if you need let's say if you're a content creator and you are actually trying to make the world better you're conscious of your thoughts and not just in the system making money for other people so that way you feel good so your ego feels good you're actually destroying the actual fabric that helps human beings and not know it and i think a lot of people are stuck in that world right now where they don't realize that they're not part of something that's better they're just doing something that makes them feel good to make money mm -hmm. um, once they become conscious of what they want to do and conscious of what their effect can be on others, well then your life starts to change, starts to spread amongst other people who see that way. And you can actually have a real effect on the world that way. Um, and one that you can be happy with leaving the earth about. Because the weird thing about our society is that most people don't think uh, about how can we leave the world better than we found it. And I don't know why that's not in every mantra. I don't know why it's not in every school. I don't know why it's not in every single religious book, but it should be. Just like leave the world better than you found it. And if we all think like that, we'll probably design better ways of that. But a lot of times it's based on money. It's based on uh, fearing something. It's not just like making things better. Hmm. So the, what I'm building is a place where people are actually consciously trying to make things better. And then, you know, if they have their YouTube channels and they're building products, like this is a media center where they, you need a camera, go get the camera. It's right there in the locker. And you have the, you know, the Canon you know, 1DX, or you can have the Sony, blah, 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 and you can go grab that. Here's the boom mics you need. Here's the lighting. It's, it's all here on premise to create high-level content and media sources 
Because unfortunately, a lot of things in the media are only based for shock value, which is almost like eating tons of sugar. Yeah. And you just get tired of it, and that's what social media really is. But it could be used as actually making the planet better with with real information. Um, so that's what I'm building actually right now. That's why I'm out here. Wow. Sounds absolutely incredible. And I feel like I'm elevated just listening to you. So this has been incredibly powerful. So a major theme for my business blog and podcast is creating the life you love through music. Where would you say you are on that path? Do you feel like you've been able to or are in the process of creating the life you love through music? Oh, man, I've been in the life that I love through music. It sounds like it. I, I've, been in, I've, been, <laughs> I've been in the life that I love through music since I started music. Love that. Um, That's amazing. Yeah, I, I can honestly say that here's the weird thing is because when I first started, I was so bad. Like I'm, when I'm telling you, I'm like, it was so bad. I would sing and people would leave the room. And I was off pitch and I couldn't play instruments and, you know, all these things I look back on and, and I just was very, very resilient. And I think that comes from my upbringing of, of not caring of where I was in the moment, but I knew as long as I was persistent, I would just get better. And if, if for instance, like my father, Purple Heart, you know, my grandfather was also in the army, um, doing martial arts at a very young age, competing, like I had to take a lot of bruises you know and how to go through that so my ego was never at the center point it was always like even if i get knocked down it should be better tomorrow who cares so i'm not going to worry about today because if i just focus on today well then of course everything's going to look like it's dismal and everything's so bad but if i'm like wait a second i'm just going to get better because i learned to dodge that punch next time well then that's not going to hit me next time yeah so when i started to really think about my career because people have asked me like you know, kind of some of the questions, what you said. And I'm like, since I started, I knew if I got better than the day before, I'd be happier because I was happy that day I made the first song. So if I can make a better song tomorrow and then a better song tomorrow. If I can have better friends tomorrow, if I can have, you know, better businesses tomorrow and I'm constantly working towards that and I'm always in the flow of feeling that, well, then I'm always going to be proud of what I'm at least I'm a part of. And, you know, along the years, I've, I've, I've found people who are inspirations to me and I've, I figured out what I think is their, my pattern recognition of them, things that make them special. And I've adapted to them and I've mimicked those things. I'm like, okay, that works for them. Let me see if it works for me. And then I would, Oh, that, that does work. Okay. I'll keep doing that. But more importantly, let me make it my own by doing it this way, make it more efficient. So as I started to do that, I can really say that I've really loved this whole career of being a musician. I think it's one of the best careers in the world, the only problem is, and I'm going to be honest, is that the music industry is broken and most people don't know it. So the experience of going to being a musician is an amazing experience, but the industry that's in front of us makes no logical sense in the way any business works. So like, let me just break this down. If, if I said to someone, um, how would your life be? Actually, I'll just ask you the question. Hmm. If I told you you can't have candles for a month. Would you, what, what level of caring one to 10? Uh, one. One. Okay. If I told you you can't listen to music for a month, one to 10. Oh my gosh. At least a nine. Okay. At least a nine. Okay, cool. Guess what? If you sold a million candlesticks, you'd be a multimillionaire. Mm-hmm. If you sold, if a million people listen to your song, you make $4,000. Right. Yeah. That makes no logical sense. It doesn't. Okay. Every other business gets paid weekly or monthly, except for us. Yeah. There's no reason why it should take musicians six months to collect a check in an age where, where Facebook has every single data point on you and can follow you all around the world and credit cards and fun, but they can't be able to collect your streams once a week. I know. It's not No logical sense. There's $1.4 billion that are just laying around because musicians haven't collected their money. Yep. Well, why? Because you have to go through all these different agencies to collect your publishing, collect your master rights, to collect this, the sound exchange, there's, there's disco. There's so many different things happening that the average person who doesn't even go to business school is not going to just figure this stuff out. 100%. And there's zero tutelage of how to do it. Agreed. Even the colleges that people spend money on, people spend a quarter of a million dollars to go to college, then they come to me and in six months, they, met, they learn more from me in six months than they learn from four years of college. Yes. And it's because the people teaching them in college haven't even attained what they're trying to teach them. Yes, absolutely. It doesn't, 
It doesn't make any sense. No. So we perpetuate this business of like, you should go to college for school. And you go, okay, well, tell me the one studio in the world that cares if you have a degree or not. Because I'm going to let you know that all they care about is if you can do the job that's at hand, not if you have a degree and from where. Mm -hmm. So because the business is so broken, and most people try to put pictures online like it's not. Like it's like the people who go and flash $5,000 in cash on their Instagram, but then that money goes right into the bank the minute they take the picture. And that money wasn't even theirs. It was their manager's money. The music business is predicated on really just en enhancing ego and narcissism. Wow. And because of that, it gets a very kind of like a like – a, like a, I call it glamouring. If you ever seen the movie, the TV show True Blood – Whenever the vampires wanted people to forget things, they would call glamoring them. Mm -hmm. That's the life we're living, where people are being filled with so much adrenaline and dopamine that they get so confused, it gets like in a trance-like state, and they're just being glamoured. Right. And it's unfortunate because you know there's a lot of people who don't have to go through that, and they go through so many ups and downs only because they're, they don't really know what they're doing. So – the life of a musician, I think, is by far, it's like probably be like being an athlete or like being a snowboarder, or doing something you love and you're making money doing it is great. Yes. But the business that's in front of us, unfortunately, is only really known by a very small percentage of people. Like probably 1% actually know the business that they're in. Most people don't study the business they're in. Um, and because of that, a lot of people get taken advantage of. Um, so it's like, it's a catch-22. If you can, can get to the top of it, it's freaking beautiful. It's great. It's an awesome ride. You meet so many amazing people around the world. Um, you have so many great experiences. Like I know I can go to so many countries right now and I have a friend in all these great countries that I can be in the studio with, make great music, have some great laughs with, and I'll know them for the rest of my life. Totally. But you know, there's some people who will never experience that because they didn't do that thing, like I said before, that hardcore, every day I'm going to become better than I was the day before. And they don't usually try to study the business. They let other people take you know, you think of the word manager, if you look at the definition, it means someone who's in control. So they give their whole entire career over to someone else, which no business owner would ever do. Never. Like, ever. Yeah. <laughs> you, said, you said to Bill Gates, like, would you give your company to someone else? He'd be like, no, no. <laughs> you said to any inventor who's like, you go to Elon Musk, would you just give your – no. Or you say to a songwriter, they're like, I need someone to take control of everything. You're like, why? I know. Oh, because you watch the movies where you get to be the narcissistic king who sits on a throne and everyone else does things for you. Ah, that makes sense from the movies. But yep. this isn't the movies. It's not. So. I hear you there, big time. And, you know, this is the thing that blockchain was supposed to come along and solve. I think, yes. I think there's still some hope there. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. It's just that there's so many interested parties, like you say, that want a hand in every song and want a hand in every album and artist to where if you don't know what you're getting into, then it's so easy to just chase after the shiny object and what everyone else is chasing. So, I love how you said the shiny object yeah. um, because what I, what I try to help my clients do and, and think like is – you know, it's like called, it's like being a splunker or being like a miner. Um, get really go good at knowing the difference between real gold and fool's gold. Yeah. Because a lot of people will chase fool's gold for years and then they finally get it and they start to like you rub on it and then all of a sudden the gold starts to rust off and you start to see like it was never gold anyway. And then if you took a hammer to it and hit it, it would just crumble. But real gold has like fortitude to, to, to it. Real gold is strong. Real gold's not chipping away anytime soon. And for instance, and I'll, I'll say this really quickly, but it's like I'll meet someone who has the best person in their career, like right in front of them. They have that friend who is intelligent, hardworking, um, understands business, is their champion, loves them as a human being, wants to see the best for them and their family. But yet that person's out there trying to find the big magic. Yes, it's true. And I'm, like, I'm like your friend's right there who's amazing. And they're like, yeah, but they don't have the credits as so-and-so. And I'm like, but how do you know that that big manager was able to take an artist from obscurity to success? Because there's different kinds of managers. There's one that is really good at, at having someone already famous. There's that person who's already good at having Ariana Grande when she's already famous. And there's another kind of person who like can build someone from the bottom up. 
You know, like there's two different kinds of people. One has different kinds of levels of patience. One has a different kind of level of drive and hearing the word no, but keep going. Where someone else might be just good at using leverage and power. And so if you have that person in your life, you can't guarantee that you'll find another person yeah. like that. And I'm letting you know, I've seen so many people throw away gold. It's insane. They, they treat it as if it's kind of like the dating scene. If the best person they're going to date is right in front of them. And they're like, yeah, but if it's not perfect, I go to someone else. And I'm like, ooh, you're not going to find that again for the rest of your life. Like it's yeah. just not going to happen. That person doesn't come around very, very rare. That's, a, that's like a unicorn that happened to come into your life. But you couldn't see it. So you were onto that fool's gold and you're never going to find that again. And I'm letting you know, I've experienced this with people that I've seen and they're still looking and they're still searching. And I just don't think they're ever going to find it because that, that thing sometimes only comes around once in a lifetime. Yes. No, you said it so well. And I have a mentor in my life that's exactly like that. He's just a wealth of knowledge and he's willing to listen and talk to me. Sometimes he's even put money into editing my books and stuff like that. No transactional expectations whatsoever. And like, it blows my mind that there is even a person like, I don't think I'm going to find that. He's like a second father to me. There's no, there's no way. There there's go. no way. Exactly, <laughs> man. I'm telling you. I'm so glad that you had someone like that in your life because I, I have several people like that in my life and I hold on to them dearly and I give yeah. back to them, you know? And I think, I think, unfortunately for a lot of musicians is that they're so geared towards taking that they don't actually give back to the people around them. And I'll tell you this, like any real artist who's successful, like Justin Timberlake and Beyonce and Taylor Swift, all those people care about the people who work for them because they know that it takes a team to build these kinds of things. But then you'll meet an artist who's up and coming and they just want everyone to do things for them. And then they'll blame, like, let me give you a perfect example. I talked to an artist recently um, he was signed to a publishing deal or he has been signed to publishing for three years. And so he came to me and he said, Adam, you know, uh, what should I do with my career? And I said, okay, well, let me ask you a question. Um, what's going on? And he goes, well, um, you know, I just feel like my publishing company isn't really doing much for me. And I was like, okay, well, what do you, what do you mean? He's like, well, when I first signed to them, you know, I had a song that was kind of going to go, it was going on the charts already because I wrote it with the artist that was signed. And so they signed me because they were like this, they thought I was going to like pop off. But then I haven't really had any big hits after that. I said, okay. I said, um, how often do you, do you go to the office? Well, first he goes, well, I don't think they're doing anything for me. He's like, I just feel like they signed me to get a, a cut off of that big song, but now they're not doing anything for me. I said, cool. So let me ask you some questions. And I go, how do you know they're not doing anything for you? Have you gone down to their office? And he's like, yeah, I went to the office when I first signed them. I said, no, 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 that's not what I asked you. How often are you going to their office? Like, when, uh, how, When's the last time you went to the office? He's like, oh, it's been months. I was like, okay. So you actually don't go down to the office that is pitching your music. And he's like, well, no. And I go, okay. So when's the last time you went to dinner with your A&R? He's like, well, when I first got signed. I was like, okay, so you don't have a personal relationship with your A&R. He's like, well, I guess not really. I said, okay. If you were to text your A&R on a Sunday, do you think that person write back? And he's like, well, probably not because we don't really text. Okay. So right now I'm hearing that you have a lack of communication with your sales team. Do you think any business owner has a lack of communication with their sales team? No. And he goes, oh. I said, all right, let me ask you some other question. I'm like, when you are working on the songs, do you, are you going out there on your own and networking to other artists and to – um, to blend them with other directors and script writers, or are you talking to branding agencies or um, uh, like marketing people who are on part of projects or creative directors at different companies? Like, are you talking to these people on a one-to-one -one basis? And he's like, no. And I'm like, okay, so you're, you're not talking, to, you're not doing any outreach for your own mm -hmm. company. And he's like, I guess not. And I'm like, so what I'm hearing from you is someone who wants to be treated as if, all you have to do is create the product and then sit there and everyone else will work for you in one of the highly most competitive industries in the, <laughs> in the world. And that's exactly what it was. It was like that moment where he just kind of sat back and I was like, yeah, I'm just letting you know that if, if I worked with you, I would think that everything you're saying sounds crazy. It sounds like an insane person to me. Like the fact that you're not doing stuff to make your own money and you're waiting for a company that you don't even talk to on a regular basis, do it for you. Like, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. And then after that phone call, he was like, 
you know, what should I do? And so I gave him like a plan. I said, okay, do this. Once a week, I want you to start reaching out to your publishers and just say hello, see what they need, see what's anything's going on, what's in the pipeline. I want you to set up an Excel sheet where you're reaching out to certain music advisors that you feel are in the demographics of music that you're creating. I want you to go to events where some of these people might be asked to meet them one on one. I want you to do this stuff, blah, 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 blah. Six months later, hits me up and he's like, he's like, yo, everything you said worked like a charm. And I was like, yeah, because now you're actually caring about your business and not wanting other people to care yeah. for it for you. It's two different things. That's huge. You know, and you're right. It's like even it's reflected in my experience. I wouldn't say, you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be featured on blogs or top blog lists or other podcasts and things like that. But I, in my experience, nobody's been as quick to do that as me. I will often mention my friends and my blog posts and books and podcasts. I will often reference people that I've learned so much from and other guests from the show. You know, I love to give credit. I love to share with people just the, the blessings and the magic that has been many of the discoveries that have come through doing this work. So, And I think what you just said, too, you said – the because what you're doing from what at least what the experience of what I'm having and talking to you is that it's the part of sharing, yeah. Uh, and it's uh, it's not you and this I could be wrong, but it feels like you enjoy helping to serve others, yes, big time, okay. And so, in that, I would say that the people who usually get the most out of life are people who have that as a trait as you being. Hmm. is someone who enjoys serving others. Like enjoy seeing someone else win. Yeah. Enjoy seeing like usually that's how things are always growing. Um, now granted, there's many people who are you know listen. Everyone has their own way of looking at life. There's some people I know who are totally cold hearted and they make billions. They, there's people right now who are selling products that are that create cancers and they're making billions from. It. They do not care about other people. Yes. But I'm not saying that you can't make money because I think unfortunately in our society there's this theory that money only comes if you're good or bad. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. No. That's, yeah. You never know if like, someone inherited money and someone is, is selling drugs. Like you don't know if someone's selling things that are negative for the universe. Like all this stuff is happening. Predators, fake news. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it goes deep, man. It goes yeah. deep. Um, people who are kidnapping people right now are making money. Like there's so many horrible ways to make money yes. that money is not success. And money also is becoming the new God where people are just – it's, I think money and Google have become the new God in sense. When people ask Google for help or ask Google for answers and they look for money as being the, the, the North Star of their universe. And unfortunately in doing that, they miss all the beauty that's actually in the soil, which is the people, the seeds. You know, so I think when you're, when you're okay with serving others, you tend to build branches and roots that are far surpassing what you could have done on your own. Hmm. And I subscribe to that chat. You know, to me, that is um, the only way to really look at existence is realizing that we're all just like a part of this, this root system. And if we can spread out and create good systems of communication and, and business and life and experiences, well, then hopefully you can live a very abundant life while you're here because nothing's guaranteed. This thing could be very short. Um, we all know people who've been great at what they do and their lives have been taken. So to expect like, that you're just guaranteed anything because you're awake today is, is another form of insanity. Yeah. And, and I just don't, I don't believe in anything more than, uh, than trying to be like what you're saying is, is sharing this information with others because someone else shared it with me and I might've had my own way of putting it together or my own way of calculating and, and creating but there's certain things that just weren't taught to me as a kid. And then when I got older, they were. And if I didn't listen to them, I could have been the same place as, you know, probably other people. Um, but I chose to, like, follow something that, that was true and is based on, I think, more factual rather than uh, something that fed my ego. Um, but, yeah, man, I think that's really cool. Like, it, there's this thing happening in society right now that – the media is training individuals to have two very distinct um, personality traits. Hmm. And those two personality traits are narcissism yeah. and insecure, insecurity. Yeah. <laughs> and if you can interlink those two like a chain, yeah. 
what it does is it creates the perfect buyer of products because the insecure person always needs to fill the hole with something like a product that they can't logically understand why they're paying for it because it doesn't make real sense. Like if you try to sell me a Gucci bag, I would laugh at you. I'd be like, why would I pay something? If, how much does it cost to make? And they'd be like hundred bucks. So why would I pay 5,000? Well, cause it's Gucci. No, no, but why would I pay $4,900 more? Well, cause the name brand. So you're saying someone's name I'm paying for. It? So what's in the name? Well, I'm paying for a feeling. Okay. What feeling am I paying for? The feeling of insecurity. I don't have that. So I'm not paying for it. Hmm. So it's, it's, it's those things. The only way you can sell me a product that doesn't make logical sense is if I feel narcissistic and insecure. And so what unfortunately happens is that we put people on pedestals in our media, let's say like actors and models, like, okay, tell me what a model does. She, she or he walks down a straight line. Mm-hmm. They, walk in a straight, they walk down a, on a straight thing and turn around. Yeah. And you want to put that person on a pedestal? <laughs> or like we pay more attention to the person who's playing the doctor than the person who's actually trying to cure COVID. You know, like we'll pay more money and attention to Dr. Gabriel Gonzalez on General Hospital than giving money to the person who's actually trying to solve our world health issues. Ain't that the truth? Yeah. So unfortunately, because of the way the media has programmed society, where people are becoming influencers, but they don't know what they're influencing. Yeah. And that is the start of really like the new Babylon, where, which is what we're living in right now where if you look at the word Babylon, people are just babbling. They don't really have think thoughts to say. They're just repeating other people's babbling. It's like yeah. just blah, 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 blah. Um, and you can see it all around. So what, what I'm noticing is that there's this crack in the human system that has a need to fit in with its different tribes and its different hierarchies. It's in our DNA because we're pack animals. Um, most people have never studied us from a DNA perspective. So because they don't have, know how our DNA works, we have these constructs around our lives that don't make any logical sense and they don't, they don't work or fit with our DNA. And then we get stuck in these mousetraps. And so for me, especially like the American quote unquote dream is like one of the great mousetraps. It's, it's called a dream because it's not something that's tangible by all people. And that's what, that's what dreams are. You wake out of a dream and it's not something you can tangibly grab a hold on to. So it's called dream. And so they, they kind of like lure you into this dream. You, you put your hand onto the trap trying to get the cheese. When you grab the cheese, you realize it was just a, a paper 3D printing of the, the cheese. It snaps on your hand. And now you're stuck working a nine to five for someone else every single day of your life on the same wheel every single day. Wake up, coffee, drive to work, put on the suit, you know, get home, Netflix, wake up, coffee, drive to work in the suit, Netflix, And then you say, when's my life going to start? And you're like, well, you've been living it, but you didn't realize you've been stuck in this dream the whole time. Yeah. So that only happens when you can grab a hold of the narcissism and the insecurity because it's the reason why people like hashtag boss chick. And I'm like, how many employees do you have? (laughs) You know, or like the guy who gets the exact outfit of the other guy with the beard, with the sleeve tattoos. Oh my God. the guitar in the hand and you're like dope if you have great music i'm all for it yeah but if your music isn't mixed well it's not produced well the lyrics aren't in depth you don't have great melody construction if, if those things aren't there then more or less you're just trying to look the part before you actually are the part and if you look at some of these artists like bruno mars beyonce katie perry um lady gaga like these artists it's not like they just like rose to fame overnight they had been like even Moon five they were signed and then they were dropped and they came back even better and they learned their craft. Mm. And from that, they, they rose to a certain level of success, but it's not just like easy to get to. No. And so I think a lot of people just look at the picture because it's very easy to replicate a picture. It's not easy to replicate the person. Yeah. And that's the truth too. And you know, it's the same thing in business, right? So many people try to model or replicate, or even I've heard people that copy the exact process that their mentor is using and they should be making the same amount of money, but they're not, it doesn't work. And I think it just says the fact that you have your own journey to walk and your hardships are your hardships and it's up to you what you do with them. 
Yeah, I mean, I think also it's one of those things like it's catch-22. So how do I say this best? Um, we all are going to go through our own hardships. How we perceive them will be completely unique to our perspe- perspective and experience. Yeah. So, you know, for instance, someone gets punched in the face. They look at that as someone beat me up. Someone did this, someone, 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 someone. And then I go, what did you do to get punched in the face? Mm-hmm. Oh, I said this, that, and the other. Okay, so it wasn't just the other person. It, you were part of that too. Next time, maybe not say this, step over this line, create this drama, blah, 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 like whatever. You probably won't get punched in the face. I mean, next time, study martial arts so you can dodge it. And maybe next, it's how you perceive the experience. Are you going to learn for it or are you going to keep on doing the same thing? And also, unfortunately, in today's society, people are making – it's not compensation. It's just attention. And they're, they're trying to quantify both of them as if they're the same, and they're not. So they'll take experiences that aren't things that we should even be harping on because if I was to rewind the clock to just you know, a couple thousand years ago, we would go, why are you talking about this? It's just a normal day. You know, like that's a normal day. And they're like, oh my God, my whole life has been defined by this one moment. I'm like, that moment? That was a normal day during medieval times. Like that's a normal day. Do you know how crazy things used to be? People would steal something and your hand was chopped off in front of little kids. That was a normal day. They would chop off your head in the middle of town. That was a normal day. And you learned to deal with it. Nowadays, people were the littlest things and they're, they're, I call it micro nuances. They react to the small, smallest thing, and they try to make it a big Instagram post. And this whole thing is if they're triumphant. And I'm like, you didn't do anything special yet, but you're trying to make everyone think you <laughs> So, you know, like things like that. Or it's just this weird way of getting attention, but it doesn't equal compensation. And once again, it's the claps. But the one thing that I've noticed is that if your whole life is designed around getting claps, it becomes a very, very empty yeah. life. And I've, I know people who are multimillionaires who, who still are not happy because they're driven by the class. Right. And if anything, they're under more stress. They're like, you know, how am I going to get the next bunch of claps? How am I going to get the next bunch of this? And then eventually they just burn themselves down. Solid, solid point. I mean, really important to distinguish that. I think uh, to kind of wrap things up, I have a quick round of questions. You're welcome to answer at any length you want. They can be short, they can be long. Um, what's the last YouTube video you watched? The last YouTube video I watched was a video on King Corsos because I want one. <laughs> <laughs> cool. What's the greatest challenge you've overcome? I don't know about greatest challenge. I'll say the greatest perspective that I've been given um, mm. because, because I'm mixed and I've been raised with different – like growing up, I never knew race. I never saw color. Um, my father, black guy, you know, like, I guess you would say my father, six, four, 250 pounds, army guy. He had a bullet in his shoulder still to the day that he died. Um, my mom, uh, you know, like a American or Russian Jew, um, family came from, uh, Jewish and Russian mafia, uh, very, very, like, our cousins are Puerto Rican. Um, I was raised around people, like, in my, my school. Like, I look back at my school pictures. You can't tell what anyone is. I mean, there's Indian, Korean, Spanish, you know, Vietnamese. Like, everything to us was just we're kids. And I look back on it, I think that was probably one of the best perspectives that I could give in this world. Because when I started to travel around America, I realized it's not like that for a lot of people. And there's yeah. a lot of segregation. There's a lot of racism. There's a lot of judgment and prejudgment and all this stuff happens. And it usually comes from a place of just not having knowledge. And so I just never had that. And I look back and I say that was one of the greatest perspectives. I'm so glad that I was born with because it's given me the ability that when I talk to someone, no matter where they're from, I can say, okay, let me look at a different perspective. And cause I can most likely see it pretty quickly. Um, and I'd say that's probably one of the greatest perspectives I was given. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't get to experience that. So they can live their whole life only seeing one thing through one perspective. And I'm like, oh, no, no. There's so many more colors to this rainbow. Hmm. 
Absolutely. And I imagine you'll answer this question similarly, but what's the greatest victory you've experienced? Victory. Oh, man. <laughs> 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 I just saw this question because like a victory means almost like a finale. Um, right. And I don't believe in those until the day that you die. So uh, yeah. I would say I am thankful for every day that I wake up um, I literally say that every morning. I'm like, every day that your eyes, your eyes are open is a day that you should be thankful because someone else's aren't. Yes. So um, I think every day has a victory in itself. Like you're able to do that. So that's, it's not a great achievement because some people are, you know, not living the best lives in the world, still waking up. But I would say as far as a victory, each day that you can become better than you were yesterday then that's a small victory in your life. And then the great finale comes when you're no longer here and what really you leave behind. Um, and I think that's the, the greatest victory won't be seen until after I'm gone. Awesome. I like that. And you mentioned a couple of books, but are there any other books that have helped you on your journey? Hmm. Books that I recommend. Um, I'll say this. Uh, if, if anyone here who is like a musician, producer, artist, like looking to really get in depth, into the career more, I would say don't just study the pictures, but study the person and look at documentaries like uh, on Motown, the Hitsville. That's a great documentary. Um, look at the documentary on Quincy Jones. Um, you see this amazing story of a guy who goes over to a whole other country where he doesn't speak the language to learn how to be a conductor on an orchestra and come back and then produce Frank Sinatra during a time point where black people were not really even hired for those kind of gigs. You know, you start to see the, the spirit of the human. And I think that is so in, imperative to, to study is the spirit of the human being. Um, one of the documentaries where I, I highly recommend, The Social Dilemma, I recommend everyone watching that so you can understand what's actually happening to your brain and how you're being manipulated right now on social media. Mm -hmm. um, I think a good movie that came out recently is The uh, Octopus, My Teacher. I've been telling people for years that octopus are not from here. And they're, I, I believe, and I've, I've been saying this for a long time, I'm like, octopus are not from here. It's the only animal on our planet that has like, I think it's, you know, like eight limbs, nine brains, eight hearts. So it's like, right. and it can mimic anything on this planet. And I was like, I don't think it's from here. I think it's from panspermia. Something fell a long time ago because of the only animal that also has 500,000 babies and it never gets a chance to teach its young, but it has like a photographic memory. So hmm. we should be thankful that they only live to be three years old. Because if octopus lived to be 100 and taught 500,000 how to hunt like it does, and they got bigger, we, we'd have some problems. Um, no doubt. But learning about octopus, I think, is really great. So on Netflix, there's a documentary on that. Another documentary that's great is uh, Kiss the Ground that just came out which tells everyone like actually what's happening in our soil, which if you know what's happening in our soil, the way I do living out here in Costa Rica, you realize what we're eating and how it affects us. And it's, it all stems from the soil and it's so impactful to know this stuff. So those are some things other than the books I talked about before, you know, Dale Carnegie, MJ DeMarco, Tim Ferriss. Um, yeah. uh, also, and I'll be honest, if you watch some of Darren Brown, um, Darren Brown is a hypnotherapist and uh, he has some specials on Netflix and if you watch him you'll notice what's actually happening in history right now on a grander scale where people are being glamoured because they don't know how their brains work and once again it's like people not knowing that how to be conscious so they're unconsciously doing things and they call it fate and I'm like no no no, no. you got to get more in depth with how your brain works and then we can talk to you about spirituality but right now you don't even know how your DNA or brain works so I can't put that I can't put spirituality into the conversation for a lot of people. So right. I, I think uh, understanding that stuff would really help individuals just really hone in on themselves. But uh, I think other than that, maybe Ralph Murphy's talk at the um, – Ralph Murphy, who was an amazing writer and, and teacher, talks about music and how hit songs are written in the 2014 – I think it's like Create Music Convention or some sort of convention he did. But he really breaks down things on an analytical level that most people have never seen. And then I'll just talk about there's one last thing. If anyone wants to become like a really high level, overly analytical um, people is David Penn has this thing called the um, uh, – he has like a music, musical breakdown. If you look at David Penn, it's called Hit Songs Deconstructed. 
he does work on hit songs that I've never seen anyone break down before. And it is so mind blowing. If you're an analytical person, you see this stuff and go, oh my God, he sees the algorithm that's happening in all hit songs. And he can explain it more importantly. Um, and then last but not least, I'm going to do a, a, you know, a shout out to our own company. Once again, shout out, I hate saying, but um, I'm going to say if anyone wants to be serious, you know, we have a private club. It's kind of like, I'm not going to say the Illuminati because Illuminati used to just mean, mean the illuminating ones. But I'm going to say in the sense where it is a, it's a group of serious musicians, producers, and our VMA award-winning directors, Grammy award-winning producers, sync agents at the biggest companies. Like we have a private club. And it's called the Billboard 500 Club. And that club is where we meet literally every day. Things are going on. We have, we have weekly Zoom connections. We, we create projects for each other. We all write and help out each other. We all produce on each other's projects. We all pitch and place together. And there is constant, constant things happening on that to where I, I don't go on social media. I, I only spend that time I spend on social media is either watching videos on tutorials on YouTube or I'm in the club because that's where everyone at a high level is interacting. Incredible. And that, that's it. That's uh, the billboard500.com. Are there any other sites we should know about? Yeah, so that's a billboard500.com. Uh, there is application process. So the best thing that people can do is like type in billboard500 uh, club application. They, and I'll be honest, I have nothing to do with how, if you get in or not. It's when you submit to it, there's a round of board directors that if you're talented enough and if they think you have enough drive, then they will admit you into the group. And if you're in the club, it's literally like you went from going like, I kind of think I'm in the music business to like, oh my God, now I'm surrounded by people worldwide who are tapped in from entertainment lawyers all around the world to you know, rappers, producers, people who are already killing it in sync are, are already active and producing. Like, I just finished doing 20 songs with one of the artists. That's already, he's the top sync artist in hip hop. I just did 20 songs with him from the club. You know, it's a whole, it's a whole different ballgame. Yeah, that's incredible. I could talk to you for hours, but thank you so much for your time and generosity. <laughs> no problem, man. No problem. Is, is there, is no there... problem. I gotta, I gotta <laughs> run, but yeah, no problem. I love, I love helping people with this stuff because I, I realize how important, or I realize the importance of just clearing out the yeah. weeds. You know, there's so many weeds out there. No one knows where to search. No one wants to find the real stuff. And I'm like, you know, once you really know the path. It's pretty easy to walk, but it sometimes can be, there's be a lot of weeds in front of y'all. So I understand. Yes, absolutely. There can. And the more we can get out of the way for people, I think the better. So thanks again. No problem. So are you ready to create the life you love through music? Would you like to land some sync licensing opportunities? Do you need help setting the right structures in place to boost your creativity and productivity? Get your copy of the Music Entrepreneur Code at musicentrepreneurhq.com slash code. This has been episode 211 of the new music industry podcast, and I look forward to seeing you on the stages of the world. Thank you for listening. Music in this episode was brought to you by Brian Young. Wherever you're listening to this right now, please consider leaving a five-star review and comment to help us get the word out about the podcast.